a little while and you shall not see me. And again, a little while and you shall see me. Again, this is taken from St. John's Gospel. In this Gospel passage, we find a description of the spiritual life. At times, our Lord makes His presence felt, and then at other times, He does not. Sometimes we feel like praying, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we get many consolations when praying, sometimes it's dry. It seems to us that He is coming and going as if we were seeing or sensing him for a little while, but then he seemingly goes away only to come back again later. I sometimes think it can be compared to a boxing match with our Lord as your trainer. At intervals, we get a break. We go to the corner, we sit down, and he fills our minds with good thoughts. He talks to us. He rubs our muscles, heals our wounds, gives us good drink, tells us how to fight better, giving us consolations of various kinds. But then it's necessary to get up (laughs) and get back out there and fight. Mostly ourselves, and at times the devil. Understanding this up and down nature of the spiritual life is very important for keeping our peace in the middle of a round When we feel like giving up, we're getting punched, we feel weak, we feel like we're going to faint. If we become attached to the breaks, that is, the consolations that God gives us, then we will not overcome ourselves easily. Let's look at it from a different angle. In the end, everyone will be possessed. Possessed. Did you know that you're going to possess God if you go to heaven and he'll possess you? You'll be possessed. The crucial point is who does the possessing. There's no absolute freedom in God's universe. The devil can do nothing but by the permission of God. Only God has complete freedom to act, and even he cannot choose to contradict himself. He cannot make another God. For us creatures, there are choices of means, whether we're going to be rowing the boat, sailing or swimming across the ocean, or grabbing a hold of a log and just paddling. What are we going to do to make it to the other side? Since our freedom only involves choosing means to an end, we can expect to be possessed at the end. When it's all done, everyone will be possessed, either by the devil in hell for making bad and sinful choices, or by God in heaven for choosing to do good and avoiding evil, for choosing his will over your own. In hell, the possession is not natural or mutually agreeable, but painful and hateful. In heaven, the will is fixed on God forever. It's agreeable. Thus, it experiences peace and love and happiness. Is this not what the gospel is pointing out when our Lord says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will become joy. Keep fighting to be possessed by God and not to be possessed by the devil. But notice something here. God brings joy after grief. After fighting in the boxing match, you get joy. Thus, for God, consolation follows the trials. Heaven follows this life. We fast today to feast tomorrow. The world wants us to feast today and we get a big headache tomorrow that never goes away. It is the opposite for the devil, isn't it? He gives consolation and joys, feasting that are always followed by confusion, guilt, and sadness, and as I said, headaches. These latter things always overtake the joys he offers. In other words, very simple, the joy of sinning 
is quickly forgotten with the sadness that overtakes it, the sadness that follows it. No one, no one in hell remembers the joy of a sinful life. No one says, yeah, I'm in hell, but boy, did I have a good time on earth. No one does that. It doesn't work. All they remember now is the evil they did. The truth of the matter is that these possessions start in this life. And they can reach even a high degree. As you know, people are possessed by the devil. They cannot reach perfect possession because that would mean they have already reached the end. That only happens in heaven and in hell. St. Mary Magdalene was seemingly perfectly possessed by seven demons. Seven is a number for, for perfection. And yet our Lord cast out these demons. So it's not possible to be perfectly possessed in this life by demons. On the other hand, there is Solomon, who seemed to have a high degree of God's Holy Ghost possessing him. He even wrote several books of the Scriptures, but the Scriptures themselves attest to the fact, as well as the fathers of the church and many of the mystics, that he did not make it to heaven. Solomon didn't make it. Even after all that he received, he didn't make it. He fell in with many women, he committed many sins, Likewise, Judas started out as an apostle. Judas, a future foundation stone of the church, but he ended by being possessed by Satan. A devil entered into him, it says, and it was night. He was an apostle, a better than Solomon. When the devil possesses man, it is unnatural, it's awkward possession, and therefore it is painful. It pushes aside the person's rational powers, and takes control of the body, making it look like the human person themselves are doing the evil that he himself is doing. The devil really only possesses the body in this life, but surely in hell he takes charge over the soul as well, claiming it for his own. Is unable to break free of his grip. When God possesses man, however, it is in a way that is fitting to man. God made man to be receptive, to share in his divine life of grace, his divine life of heaven. Confirmation makes this delightful possession more possible. Recall that man was created in a state of grace at the very beginning. Adam and Eve were created in a state of grace. When we are in a state of grace, God gives us many things to help us feel comfortable on the supernatural plane, to feel at home in our relationship with Him. He gives us virtues of faith, hope, and charity, which in turn elevate the moral virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. But He also gives us those special gifts of the Holy Ghost by which He can come in us, as we've mentioned, and work without us getting in the way, it's that little radio receiver that enables him to guide us through difficulties. It's the wind of the sails that enables the ship to take off and make it more readily to its destination. Yes, these special gifts of the Holy Ghost by which he can come and work in us without us getting in the way. The more we pull back and the more God can come and take over and work through us, the wind will fill the sails and will receive guidance from our radio tower. The further we advance in the spiritual life, the more we will want this to happen. At some point, when we are nailed to the cross in total crucifixion, these gifts come to the foreground and we, and we are in a way possessed by God. The saints, it's called the unit of life. Those who made it to the highest levels were possessed lovingly, comfortably, enjoyably by God. Thus they could levitate, they could speak prophecy, they could see into your soul. They could bilocate across the world. They're possessed by God. And God starts to draw all men to himself through that saint. 
how many people have been saved through a saint. They bring a whole train load of people to heaven. What did our Lord say? When I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Those souls that are possessed by God are lifted up, even literally at times. And they share the wounds of Christ. They've made it back to the home waters. They're possessed. At this point, we enter into the highest levels of prayer, such as infused contemplation through the action of the Holy Ghost, working through these gifts. We find examples of this in the lives of St. Teresa of Jesus and St. John of the Cross. In others, this possessing power of the Holy Ghost may move the individual to heroic acts of charity and apostolic labors. Many examples exist, all the great saints. But I love Joan of Arc because she's so clear in a 17, 18, and 19-year-old. She insisted against all odds that the army go to confession. Here's a little girl against a whole army that's dispirited, difficult, and sinful. She insists they go to confession and attend Mass and get rid of all the servant women in the camp. One 17-year-old girl against an army of men, or more to the point, against their generals who are stubborn, unbending, and habitual in their ways of thinking and acting. She won the day. They did what she said. And perhaps this is the best victory of all her battles. And her army changed. It became spirited. Once again, such insistence on virtue and morality in an army could only come by God's grace acting through the sacrament of confirmation. Think about it. After her capture, she stood up against a court of 50 or so men who could rest. They kept her up. She had no counsel. She was alone. And not just any men, but bishops and priests and scholars. They all conspired and worked together to get her to fall, but were incapable of doing so. This clearly shows that God was there for her. He was possessing her. He gave her counsel and understanding that confounded her enemies. Let's seek to be completely possessed by God. How? By becoming more and more passive to His working in us. In other words, we need to be completely faithful to the inspirations and graces that God grants us through the radio signals, the divine wind that blow. We need to continue fighting ourselves, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and the boxing ring of the spiritual life. This is the path to perfect possession by God. The opposite way is paved by giving in to our pride, our selfishness, Unwilling to fight ourselves, we'll give in to the world and the devil and the flesh. Let's get back out there in the boxing arena of this world and fight. Joy will follow the grief and trials of this fight. Now we should end today by realizing this beautiful truth. We should safeguard our sacramental co covenants, our sacramental agreements. In baptism, we enter into a covenant. We make vows. We should protect them and safeguard them by placing them in the Ark of the Covenant, the spouse of the Holy Ghost. She will keep them safe in heaven with her body, where her body is united with her soul and is untouchable by the devil. She can crush his head at will. When we need the graces of our baptism, of our confirmation, in the future, maybe ordination or marriage or religious life, profession of vows, if we place those there and we need graces, all we need to do is return to the ark like Moses did of old or the apostles did on Pentecost. We pray to Our Lady especially the third decade of the glorious mysteries, and the Holy Ghost will come down. He will stir up the graces designated for us 
through the sacrament, then we can engage more readily in struggles and battles for the faith, for the glory of God, and note that Our Lady of La Salette, an approved apparition, indicated the effectiveness of this practice by saying that I call on my children, those that have consecrated themselves to me, in other words, the true faithful, those who have given themselves to me, she says, so that I may lead them to my divine son, those whom I carry in my arms, so to speak, those who have lived on my spirit, She calls them to be children of the light. Confirmandi, little children, put your covenant, your agreement of your baptism and your confirmation in the Ark of the Covenant tomorrow. When you are confirmed, it will be kept safe. And when you need those graces, go there and stir up those graces and God will help you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.